okay. All right, all right. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Queen Marjana and yes, I am a core member of, thank you so much for the hearts. <laughs> I'm a core member of Women for Sustainability Africa. And personally, I've been enjoying the wave all along and it's always really exciting to, you know, be in a space of people who want to learn more about sustainability and not just learn about sustainability, but also um, are very keen to like contributing, right? So as curious as I was, I went to Twitter and I looked for a hashtag and the hashtag that I looked for was close to today's topic, you know, clean energy. But the specific hashtag that I looked for was hashtag renewable energy. And I saw a couple of things like the, the, the plants in India. And there was a question that was posed, uh, okay, for example, how reliable is, you know, renewable energy? And I know that aside this couple of questions that I have or I've seen on Twitter, for example, a lot of you here may have questions about renewable energy, but not to worry, we have a resource person who is going to, you know, I don't, I don't know if I should say download or re-download, you know, who's going to explain everything about renewable energy. And then we'll have a session where you can ask all your questions. So if your friend is not on this um, call or on this session, um, don't worry because this is going to be recorded. And if it's recorded, it means that they can always have access to this. So um, without wasting so much time, I would like to introduce our resource person for today, who is the, in the person of Gloria Kafui Kuzo. So the most interesting thing I like about Gloria is that she's an environmentalist and also a journalist, um, meaning that she's using her voice very well in the sustainable space. And she also believes that youth are the voices and action of change. Gloria works with Strategic Youth Network as the lead on just transition and energy transition. So please help me drop an emoji, especially the party emoji, the one that comes with the, um, how do you call it, the straws and all that, and please drop it while we welcome Gloria to the stage. Hello, Gloria, how are you doing today? Health is like super long term. And I feel, I feel like everything we do as individuals kind of revolve around that. So personally, yes. awesome, so take the ball, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so about understanding Ghana's clean energy part for the future, first we have to understand why there's a need for us to embark on this. So what we see around these days, there's um, a lot of harsh weather conditions, the sun is so hot and so bad and then we're asking ourselves what is the cause of all of this so the english name for all of this is climate change and if climate change is happening what at all is climate change so we are looking at um climate change being a shift in the temperatures and the patterns so you see that first we used to have um two seasons but you know that, okay when you plant it will surely rain for you to harvest now we have um, unpredictable rainfalls and you are asking if this this becomes a norm for the next five to ten years how are we going to survive because now you can't say you are wearing any dress that has to do with the cold everything is so hot and so bad so going forward to the what can we be able to do then we realize that there's a core phenomenon which is known as fossil fuel so with fossil fuel, it has to do with anything that comes out with emissions, that comes out with pollution. So what are some of examples of this fossil fuel? We have coal. So we know um, at first, when you used to watch the cartoons, the movies, you know, they have this train and then they put something inside the train. So it helps the train to be able to power. Then you see the smoke in the atmosphere. Yeah, so this are, that's an example of coal. And then with the greenhouse gases to it also cast across anything that can be able to bring out emissions that is bad that when you inhale into your system it's not good for you so we have also seen places and communities where there are droughts where there was a lot of water but now all the water has been dried up we also saw places that they were good 
farming and all that stuff. And now people are not able to farm anymore. And then you are asking yourself, is this how it's going to be for the next five to 10 years? If this is how it's going to be for the next five to 10 years, then what is the guarantee for me and the next generation to come? So then that, that leads to the part of clean energy. We have to put in place to make sure that whatever we want to be, whatever we want to achieve will be achieved. So globally, we have what we call the Conference of Parties, which is COP. So every year, we have government stakeholders going in to represent their countries and coming up with sustainable ways so that the country and the environment can be better. So during COP last year, which is COP 28, it was established that there's a need for us to push in double renewable, that is the use of more clean energy, and then triple the use of energy efficiency. So I'm going to break that down as we go. Clean energy, what I told is clean energy. So clean energy looks at renewable energy and technological style that has not emit any kind okay oh, yeah you can take the floor Check is very bad today yeah i think this is so, really better now yeah okay so for every country we have the global movement which is called energy transition so here in ghana we have what we call ghana's energy transition and is backed by two documents, which is Ghana's Energy Transition Framework and Ghana's Energy Investment Plan. So the two documents, I'll go again, Ghana's Energy Transition and Ghana's Energy Transition Framework. So with this plan, there are certain highlights and things that Ghana wants to go by. Actually, every country has its own transition plan and how they are going by to be able to achieve this target. So Ghana is is no exception and Ghana wants to also be able to achieve that target. Let's put in mind that there's net zero target. Okay, so what are some of the highlights then in this? First, we have to put in mind that the transition is taking place from 2022 to 2070. And now we are in 2024. So that means we barely started two years away. So if we started two years away, what is the core focus of this transition? Is looking at all citizens, all Ghanaians, Leaving dependency or any reliance on petroleum or any other thing that has emitted. It's always looking at Ghana moving to a place where we no longer rely on cars that have to do with petroleum and all of that, from coal to cars that have to do with electricity. So we powering the cars. That way, there will be less fossil, there will be less emission, there will be less pollution. And you ask yourself, at all, can Ghana be able to achieve this? Will we get to a place that will be able to achieve it? Well, from another school of thought, you, you say that, okay, the transition is also from 2022 to 2070. So surely it's very possible. Another highlight from the transition is also universal access to electricity. So we are looking at it that actually with this, we have a target by that by 2030, in every part of Ghana, there's supposed to be universal access to electricity. So if it's 2030, then, then we have six years to go to be able to achieve this. Another highlight from the transition is that we have seen that women rely solely on um, wood, charcoal for their cooking. Now we want an alternative. It is a clue kick and clean cooking method. So if there's going to be a clean cooking method, then that means our charcoal and all those things we buy, we have to switch from using all those kinds of fossil fuel products to sustainable products like pressure cook stoves. So by statistics, we have it that women die annually. We have 48,218 women who die premature death because of of the quality of air they inhale and then because their health is at stake we all agree that when we're going to buy our kinky and all that we're going to get the firewood going into the cooking and the smoke that is coming out and they inhaling the smoke you'll be like you love your kinky and your pepper all right but the outside also is very very shaking about that so for that to be able to happen the transition envisions that 30.5 million productive hours will be gained when women 
switch to using um, clean cooking fuels. This way, they don't have to depend on the firewood anymore. They don't have to inhale all this smoke and all those stuff. And they'll be able to live long. I know we love our parents, love our mothers. We want them to live long for us to be able to enjoy them more. However, there's also a, a stake on um, jobs. We have a lot of youth crying out that there's a lot of um, unemployment going on. If there's a lot of unemployment going on, then Ghana switching from the use of fossil, fossil fuels and going back to clean cooking alternative, clean cooking technologies, new technologies, will mean there's going to be a lot of jobs globally, internally and in Ghana. So if there's going to be a lot of jobs, how are you and me in our is respective Fields. How are we going to be able to harness the opportunities over there? Okay, uh, maybe you are a journalist, maybe you are an IT person. Looking at the transition going, what do you need to learn more so that you're still relevant and sustainable in the in the process going on? So that's another part for us. And then there's the question that we do not have the strength, um, like the people outside United States and so on. If they are going, to, they have envisioned by that by 2060, they are going to achieve net zero, where they are no longer going to emit, they are going to solely depend on renewable energy staffs. Um, then Ghana, Africa, we do not have the strength as these people. What are we going to do? Then the introduction for a just energy transition comes in. Where is going to be? We are going to consider the livelihoods of people. We are going to look at the economic state of countries such that we do not have the strength as these people, but this is how we want to go by it year in and year out. So the whole transition and visions for Ghana is um, 562 million billion US dollars. So that is what is going to take for Ghana to be able to achieve this process. I'm sure you are asking, how are we going to get the money we need to be able to achieve this process. Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to proceed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to proceed there. Okay. So, so then look at, okay, if we're going to take 500 plus billion US dollars, in which sectors is this money going to apply? And how at all are we going to um, raise this revenue? So for the energy sector, we are looking at it costing 72 billion for electricity, transportation, and distribution. Then we are looking at 262 billion, which is going to focus on electricity generation, which you mean that people who are off grid, who are also living on the islands, and so they are, so far as they are part of the country, they are also supposed to also gain electricity. So, as part of the transition phase, the transport sector is one of the sectors that emits a lot because. Um, where you are going for maybe Medina, from La Paz and wherever, most of the cars that pass by you, the fumes that come out of the exhaust pipe is nothing to write home about. And then you are inhaling this day in and day out. And so for some of us, our roads are also, not, we are also inhaling that day in and day out. So if our transport sector is part of the emission force and one of the greatest emission force, then there's a need for us to look to address issues at that part. And then we are looking at breaking it down to the grassroots level. How are we going to break this down for those who have relied on their taxes for the past 10 to 15 to 20 years? Who they know they have to change those taxes, but they rather use um, cloth to tight uh, the gates for, for truck, truck drivers to be able to get ends. As well as you know, there's a need for them to be able to change their, their cars. The over-reliance on this, their source of livelihood. We are saying that, okay, the transition is also going to bring a new job for young people. But what happens to those who have also do, who do not have alternative source of um, livelihood, who do not have an uh, alternative source of skills development? How are they also going to continue in this transition phase? So um, for industrial and service costs, we also have 7.5 billion estimated costs going to that sector. So I earlier mentioned that there are lots of opportunities as it goes. I'm sure when your questions comes, I'll be able to break this down. But 
one opportunity that we cannot do away with is new technologies. There are going to be new technologies. Now AI is coming in, AI has become dominant. However, there are going to be more technologies as it go forward. As a young person, what are you learning? What are you investing in yourself? You are in the investing, you are done, you are working in your various institution. What a transition method have you taken such that when you uphold it, in the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years, your job still become relevant and that you are feeding yourself into the green space and that whatever job you are doing is also going to be sustainable. So we are looking at getting 1.4 million new jobs. So if there's going to be new, these new jobs in the transition phase, no matter the sector you are, you can be able to get jobs can be able to recommend, even become a boss of your own, because what the transition does is that it's bringing up new entrepreneurs in the job space and pushing about green jobs. What job are you doing? How green is this new job? How sustainable is this new job? Who can who can you be able to also employ so that, because you're always complaining there's no job, but the transition actually is bringing new jobs. We are right, so we need funds. What sustainable element is in your grant that when you're going to submit to donors, they are going to say, okay, this connects with a transition that we want to, so we are going to give you the money. Because all these donors are also moving away from the use of fossil fuel. So we all our grants and staffs have to move from fossil fuel dependence into clean energy. So another key highlight I mentioned from the beginning was that last year in COP Dubai, it was mentioned that there's a need for us to increase, double the use of renewable energy and triple the use of energy efficiency. And this target is by 2030. So we we'll ask ourselves, okay, what at all does energy efficiency covers and why is it so important? So for energy efficiency, it, it looks as we're using less energy to perform the same tax and um, perform and to produce the same results. So energy efficiency, we're using less energy to perform the same tax to produce the same results. And so we, in our various homes, I know we all use fridge, we all use fans, TVs, like all this equipment. Do you know that there's actually a particular app that you can install whenever you are going to buy product to ensure that your product is efficient? Yes, there is um, an app like that, which is the Energy Efficient Star Lipman. So when you download it with the, the app, um, it is a yellow labeling and has the star um, black star labeling on it. So the black stars are five. So the more the stars, the more efficient your product is. So if you go and buy the product and the yellow labeling, you have three stars. That means your product is very efficient to a particular level. If the star is four, is more efficient. This is five, is more efficient. So what you have to do is you download the certified appliance app. So when you are going to buy your, your fridges and all of that, you, you ensure that the yellow labeling is on the refrigerator. So when you see it there, however, there are a lot of fix in the system too. So to ensure that your refrigerator you are going to buy, then to give you all the information of the product you are going to buy. That's where you know that, okay, I'm maybe I'm going to buy a Samsung. And then when you insert, you know, okay, Samsung, when you insert and it's not Samsung, it's another product, it will tell you, for you to know that you are being cheated or be lied on. However, when you put the meter number, no information comes, that means the product is fake. And so you should be aware of this. So what areas does all of this we are seeing factor into? This areas factor into SDG 7, that is energy access, we make sure that we have clean energy for all people and everywhere and that is accessible for everybody. However, another document that is essential for us to read um, is Ghana's NDCs. It highlights um, a lot of stuff that are interesting there for us to be able to read, for us to know the do's and don'ts and everything going on at that side. So for the NDCs, which is the nationally determined contribution, it highlights that there's a need for us to um, accelerate sustainable energy transition. There's a need for us to enhance early warning and disaster risk management. And then there's a need for us to also restore our landscape because we have seen that there's a lot of um, deforestation going on. Um, we do not have safe communities anymore. 
do not have smart communities. We want to live in a smart community whereby we are going you are in your community. We have people riding their bicycles. We have people using vehicles that do not emit. We have um, um, in city forest where we have plants, a lot of plants and trees in there to give us fresh air, such that we can be able to live long and sustainable in the way that we also want. So to proceed, why is there a need for Ghana to be able to embark on this process? What if we do not um, join them in this way and we decide to live with our old trolls, we decide to live with this kind of product, this home use products that would always take away high cost of electricity, will not allow us to save? Why is there a need at all for us to do this? Is there a possibility where we no longer we do not have to even do this in the first place. No, the answer is there's a need for us to be able to do this in the first place, else Ghana becomes a dumping site for countries who have transitioned. So we know that, okay, countries are no longer, in a particular year, countries are no longer going to depend on cars that um, use petroleum. They're going to use EV cars, electric vehicle cars. They're going to use charging stations. What then becomes of the cars that solely depend on petroleum, if they no longer leave, need it outside there, which country becomes a dumping site? But when we all collectively transition together and we are all having our transition phenomenon and we are strong on our brands and we want to achieve A, B, and C, and then we are going to move from A, B, and C, no country can be able to dictate to us what we are supposed to do day in and day out. So, I mentioned earlier that Ghana also has the investment plan um, where it looks at how Ghana is going to generate money for all of this, how are we going to achieve all of these targets, how are we going to set apart things we want to be able to achieve, what are to, why is there a need for us to be able to achieve all of this. Right. So for the investment plan, um, that was... The document was created by MESTI, and then for the energy transition framework, it was created by the Ministry of Energy. So they are two separate do documents. However, they are all highlighting the need for Ghana to be able to transition. So it mentioned in investment plan, it mentioned four key decarbonization uh, methods. What we are trying to say is that I mentioned key solutions for Ghana to be able to move from the dependency of fossil fuel to clean energy method. So one key um, instrument I mentioned was a need for us to be able to use renewables. So there's going to be a time where I think when we go in now, we see companies, we see houses with solar panels on top of them trying to generate the heat we have solar bulbs we have solar chargers uh, in whatever quantity they come in yes and then for the second one there's going to be a need for um the batteries the batteries are going to be able to power these ev cars and then these batteries depend on solely on critical minerals such as lithium and recently we know that ghana has also been able to find lithium what processes are we putting in place such that with the critical minerals we find which is very essential for the whole world. What are we going to use it for so that Ghana becomes a top notch and becomes always relevant in the transition phase? And another form is a use of clean cooking method and clean cooking stoves. So when next you are going to buy anything for your parents, clean cooking methods, you are purchasing clean cooking staffs in your various homes, you should make sure that it's sustainable because the Ministry of Energy and the World Bank is putting in place the clean cooking strategy, which will soon be ready, which will help us to be able to get the understanding we need, certain products we are supposed to buy, why we have to buy those products. And alternatively, it's for our own good, for us to be able to save costs, reduce emissions, live healthy, have a green economy, a sustainable environment for all of us to also be able to be happy. Right, Kafri, I uh, just wanted to chip into something real quick. Um, you spoke about um, clean energy and, you know, trying to encourage people that people should, you know, really pay attention to clean energy. But there is something that is um, very intriguing, which is that how can we realistically, you know, transition renewable energy 
for like the marginalized community or how can like the marginalized community benefit from the shift to renewable energy? Because there's one thing to understand that, okay, fine, um, renewable energy is good. I want to accept it, but from a marginalized perspective or to a marginalized community, what I get audience, how can they benefit from the shift to renewable energy? So uh, addressing it from the grassroots, you should know that they do not have the opportunities people in the urban centers have. So if you are saying, okay, there's going to be the use of solar panels, I know of schools who are outside our class and the urban centers who have um, the solar panels for them to be able to um, get the necessary electricity access in it too. And now it's, it comes as low as the bulbs we use in our various homes. So we have bulbs that are solar bulbs. So you use them and during times where they are doomed, so you just on it and then you are able to also have electricity we are not we are what we are trying to pitch is that we are not saying ghana can be able to achieve this in one year two years three years four years or five years that's why we are saying is from 2022 to 2070 and since the transition that started mainly started two years away we are saying that's going to take a lot of work for us to be able to achieve it however we do address the fact that all Ghanaians do not have the same economic status. So for, for someone to be able to achieve A, someone B will not be able to achieve. That's why it, come, it comes down to um, our selected MPs we choose in their manifestos. What sustainable input have they put in there for the young peoples in their community? Does it only leave to the point that when they get power, they do not come back? We ought to we ought to look when they come for town hall meetings, when they come to, when they come and talk to us, what are we looking out for? The more questions are we asking them, such wow. that we know that we are at the grassroots level. We do not enjoy certain privileges as people here. But you as our leader, as our representative, what are you pushing here into our country so that I can in our region so that I can be sustainable for us, for us to be able to enjoy this? Why is there constant migration to people in Accra? Why is it that people in a in a local or areas you cannot be able to put things in place so that people in a that come back and live in this community? So the transition is going is not going to be that easy. That's why we are asking that it should be just. Just means it should be equal. It should consider the livelihoods of people at every sector, mm. so that we can all be able to enjoy this. Yeah. So I can quickly round up so that we can. I have just one point to add then i'll just end it so okay. that we can give room for um questions and answers okay uh -huh. so what steps are they are there for us to be able to put in this we have the saying that um ignorance is no excuse you you ought as a youth as a young person you ought to be reading you have to know all these policies because if these real stakeholders come to you and do not know these policies you'll not be able to seek for accountability that you want to be able to achieve. So read up right, go on the internet, Ghana's energy transition, you read this, Ghana's renewable energy master plan, you read it, climate change policy, you read this, you know all of this green job strategy, you read this, okay, how can I make my job green? How can I make the field that I am in so green such that I fit into the transition phase? How am I using social media? Because now social media is a tool. As a youth, how can I be able to campaign for the various field that I'm in? Okay, fine, I do not have the, the knowledge. Who has the knowledge? Who can I tap? Um, the knowledge from such that I can also be able to understand what the person is saying so that I can also become relevant in the space that I'm in. How am I even monitoring and evaluating things that are going on in my community? So to round up, I will say that the whole world is looking at achieving net zero. And net zero is when we no longer depend on any fossil fuel and we do not emit any form of um, emissions. So if you're no longer going to emit we are solely going to depend on something. What steps as young people are we putting in place for us to be able to factor in? Because there's a lot of opportunities for young people out there. And the young people out there are also going to be the policy makers in the next five, 10 to 15 years. And how are we going to be able to change or make good achievements if we do not read, if we do not um, 
take up the opportunities that we have now. So that the green economy that we want, the sustainable economy that we want, what we, we blame our predecessors for, we do not continue in the uh, in that sector. So I would say that for us to be able to achieve net zero, for us to be able to achieve the clean energy path we want to, um, we cannot say, okay, fine, for the next one year, two years, we'll do our first of all. It's a gradual process that we are going to be able to. However, there's a need for us to put in mind that energy efficiency and renewable energy is the goal for this. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a lot of um, very, very insightful things. Even I, in the sustainable space, trust me, I learned a lot. I mean, talking about how we need... 50 or was it 5062 billion i was like just opened my mouth for like a second i froze i was like oh my god that's a lot of money it's not like it's not small money at all that's a lot of money and sometimes all these processes take there are sometimes they're, most times actually they are capital intensive right so you spoke about um how like people from marginalized group can you know um join the terrain of like you know ensuring that we transition into like a more renewable um, energy in our ecosystem or like in our environment. But, you know, there's always two sides of the coin. You have people who see the the value in something and then you also have people who feel like, okay, so this is like so much noise. Because for me, um, if you go to Twitter right now, you put hashtag renewable, renewable energy, sorry, X, not Twitter, X and you search for renewable energy you still find people saying things like how what is the longevity of you know renewable energy and i believe that there are definitely potentials or you know let's say people who are opposing these initiatives within like a communities so what are some of the strategies that you think that we can use or we can literally look at as individuals to really ensure that we address potentials or sometimes or potentials are like people who are kind of causing resistance or opposition to the renewable energy initiatives within our community. Oh, you've muted yourself. <laughs> you've muted yourself. First of all, we have to understand that the renewable energy space is a gradual space that will eventually come up, whether we like it or not. However, Ghana has the potential. Ghana has all the minerals that right. the people from outside even need to make that vision possible. Mm. So if you look at your country has the physical minerals, they they have everything to make it possible. And then they are looking at achieving it, whether you like it or not. But you are looking at, okay, maybe my business does so-and-so. Maybe I'm going to lose so-and-so if I maybe join the way. But have you also thought about the fact that you can make that business a green business? You don't have to alternatively change everything about the business, but you have to look at making the business green and sustainable so that you can be able to project that business for a very long time. Because the effect of not doing nothing at all has much effect rather than doing something and achieving what you should be able to do. And for the people at the grassroots level, we have people who are maybe, maybe let's say farmers. We have people who are teachers. Um, I don't, yeah, we have a lot of employment um, sticks at that side. What are you teaching that student for that student to become an ambassador for change? Such that when the, that student becomes a policy holder in future, the person takes relevant policies that uh, tends to affect you, gives you a good position standing in the next future. The, the grassroots people are the people also mostly crying for change. However, when this change also happens, the overdependence and the stagnant segmentation on the fossil fuel makes it difficult to change. So, okay, you go to your mom, okay, ma, I don't want you to use maybe charcoal anymore. I don't want you to use maybe um, firewood anymore. I want you to now use maybe gas because Ghana's um, transition for is gas and then other um, clean cooking um, fuel types. I want you to use maybe gas. Um, One, she has over dependence on fossil fuel. She has a, a, the on um on firewood she has it in mind that when she uses firewood it's very fast 
and um, she can be able to achieve what she wants to be able to achieve. She's used to that. She has lived with fire for a long time. She also have it in my okay. When I start using the gas, <clears throat> sorry, what if uh, it leaks or it's like the fear of not being the fear of perfection of not it being able to be able to achieve its target. But you also have to put in mind that your health is very, very important. Because earlier when I mentioned that the number of death that is accumulated because of the inhale, uh, the quality of air alone. Because in, in uh, early January, the quality of air in Accra was very, very bad. So you could see from the EPA um, social media output that they were always giving, telling people to wear nooks, masks, and this and stuff. The quality of air we take into our body is very, very important. And at the grassroots level, if we do not address this, it's going to be very bad because the, the person at the ministerial level, when the person falls sick, which hospital in Ghana does the person go to? You are the local level where you fall sick. Which hospital do you go to? We have to be able to put all these things in place for us because it's, it's for our well being, it's for us in person, not for any other person to enjoy, it's for our well being as people. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. You know, when you're talking about your mom, for example, if your mom has, is used to using firewood all her life, it just reminded me of something. You know, I used to have a friend who used to tell me that. Charlie, firewood jollof is more delicious than the jollof the cooking does. And I asked her, I was like, ah, why would you say that? It's like, no, the smoke that comes with firewood jollof alone makes it <laughs> very nice. So um, you see that this kind of, like you said, some of these things is like people are kind of like used to it. And for me, trust me, I also tasted jollof rice where I felt like I was eating smoke. Like I could, I could literally smell... <laughs> like i could tell because like i have a very good um smell of nose i'm like okay this looks like this 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 firewood was actually a shea butter plant or a neem tree i'm able to tell like when i burn charcoal i'm able to tell which of them uh which kind of tree the wood came from so that brings me to our next question um i, li I, li I love the fact that you spoke about um technology you spoke about ai and you spoke about how it's not good to just li literally say okay uh, I've been selling firewood all my life. So, okay, now this is a new trend. How do I tap in? You need to look for more greener ways to go. So, obviously, we live in, a, in, a, in an environment where technology is leading. It's like a leading, major leading force right now. And it's really skyrocketing at a very high rate. Uh, my question is, how can we really leverage these technological innovations to really, you know, improve or, like, maximize the effectiveness of, you know, accessible renewable energy? especially in this kind of crucial phase, which is a transition phase. Okay. So <clears throat> clean technologies like I go to in this transition phase. And so let me just um, narrow down to just one clean technology aspect. So there's going to be the production of more um, EV stations, the charging stations where these EV cars are be, uh, will be able to charge their vehicles. And then in the composition of this charging station, there's going to be the use of lithium. And then I mentioned that Ghana has been able to discover lithium. As young people, let's say at, at the grassroots level, quarter, quarter, what are we putting in place such that the, the guy who is a mechanic doesn't only now have the idea of how to repair cars that use fossils, but now has idea on how to repair cars even those who into spare parts, like the transport sector in general, how to, which in, we have a lot of engineers in Ghana who go to the university and learn staff in the technological area. How many people can Ghana boast of, or is Ghana going to be able to boast of that? We are teaching these particular people on everything that has to do with EV cars. We are teaching these people everything that has to do with the charging station, how to repair, how to fix, how to draw, like the, everything of the components of this car, such that when they come, we do not have to also rely on um, employing people who are outside, but we are employing people who are locally here to be able to boost the economy status that we have. Okay, fine. We have um people who are in the universities. We have people who are uh, who also didn't go to the investing bus. When you look at the transport um, space, it has one of the great employment um, factors. So if we have one of the uh, greatest employment factors, and we already have about 2,000 EV cars 
in the system. That means they are already ongoing. However, the charging stations that we have in the country is less than five. So if it's less than five, we should be, and we are hoping to bring in more, build in more, we should be able to have people with this technical know-how. And then we should put in our mind as young people that now we're in a technological era. Everything that we do is going to be technology, whether we like it or not. So then we also have to be able to go into this field. We should not leave this field for people at the grassroots level. It's a boost for you to finish school with a degree in how to be able to do all these components because from 2022 to 2070, just add the range to your age. You are going to be so valuable and needed in this um, green space. So in the technological era, as young people, just even focusing on the transport sector, there's a lot that we can be able to achieve there. Okay, all right. Thank you so much for that insight. So while I'm asking um, Kafui some of the questions, in between, if you have questions you'd like to ask Kafui, please do feel free to drop them in the chat box. And if you are enjoying the session so far, please drop an emoji. For me, I'm going to drop an emoji for you, Kafui, because like you literally just... You sliced everything nicely. This is like a whole meal ready to be consumed. <laughs> okay, so um, I know you already touched a little bit about the marginalized group or like how to ensure that this transition or you know this re renewable energy transition reaches like um, places that are marginalized or like places that deserve inclusivity. But I want to talk about we personally, maybe each other each one of us on this call and each of each one of us also listening to this call like personally how can we really ensure that we enable people who are from like you know marginalized communities or people who are like based on history they've been like underserved you know there's certain parts of like the world or let's say in Canada in that based on history this this is this is what these people have been doing for a long time so we as individuals, how do you think we can, you know, contribute to these people so at least we can, you know, give them like a stepping stone to like move forward in this transitional phase? Okay, so the first thing I will say is you should be educated and have the necessary knowledge you need because when you're going to talk to these people, these people have certain livelihoods they depend on it. So they are going to ask you lots of questions and you should be ready to give them all the necessary answers. And then you should also be able to factor in the fact that it's going to be sustainable. So there's a need for green jobs. And if there's going to be a need for green jobs and there's going to be a provision for 1.4 million new jobs with a net of 400,000 new jobs, maybe if you are going to an area maybe where they, they depend on farming, you should you map out the areas you are going to talk to. You already have up with the alternative source of livelihood these people can be able to harness so that when you go in, they can be able to jump in for that. And then the young people in the community also, you focus on them. How can young people in the community be able to jump in for that? What are young people in the community doing? What can they do to be able to join into this transition? And what is their level of education? Are we going in with advocacy? Are we going in with capacity building? Are we going in which area are we going with partners, with organizations? Are we going in to educate these people to be able to also come on board? Because... <clears throat> In the country, sometimes you're in a country whereby certain things happen before you realize certain things have happened. Now we're no longer going to live with that kind of phenomenon anymore. We have to be educated and have another source of answer, alternative for them that when we go to sector, mm -hmm. okay, then, daddy, there is no, I would want you to move from the use of petroleum cars to um, the use of renewable. What is the there's the source of finance. What's the net worth of even the man you are going to tell him to move? Can he afford it? Who is going to afford for him? Is that provision for affordability? Because mm -hmm. in as much as you want, to, we should also look at the pockets of these people who are also exactly. going to move. Yeah. One have plans to also bring maybe vehicles at a subsidized um fee. If it comes at a subsidized fee, how many years are these people going to be able to pay for it? Because if it doesn't become a, if it doesn't break down to the grassroots level, then the transition becomes like an elite transition, which shouldn't be so. So we also have to look at all these kinds of 
source of alternative. What are we teaching people in the universities? We want them to be in the green space. We want you to come out and be your own source of entrepreneur, such that maybe when you're into recycling, maybe when you're into other parts of um not only the environmental space, but whatever space you find yourself into. Even if you're in the the you're into maybe food drinks, you can make it sustainable. Make sure that the, the bottles you are using are recyclable. So that when you are done, it can be able to be used for something else. How sustainable are you doing your business? How are you making it? Maybe you are into the provision of these drinks. Okay, another person can be into um, purchasing and selling. Another person can be into the bottle and maybe manufacturing. Another person can be into uh, the distribution of the food. How are you making it sustainable? Breaking it down to the lowest form for these gratis people to be able to harness the opportunity. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much, Kafri. I, I really just um appreciate the fact that you highlight that as even as a business owner, you should try and see how you can, you know, tap into the space, the sustainability space and the you know energy transitions space. I think in the last couple of years, we've actually realized a lot of Ghanaian drink companies or even water companies have really embrace the the notion of recycling things. Sometimes you buy certain kind of brands of water and you see um this bottle was recycled. For me, when I see those things, I'm usually very happy. And I think uh, one of those drink brands in Ghana came out to say they had changed their, their bottles because at first it was very dark, now it's lighter. So like, I think these are like really, really very smart ways of, you know, really tap into that trend. It doesn't mean that they're going to lose a lot of business for, you know, using the old thing that they, they, they are using. They are just also trying to also, you know, transition and ensure that they don't also lose out. Um, at the same time, they're also impacting the environment. So um, this brings me to my next question, Kafui. And you know that like sometimes when you're doing a good purpose or you're doing something good, it always comes with challenges, definitely. Even the most simplest act of good deed you do, you do come, comes with challenges. If you see a stranded cat on the road and you help the cat and you bring the cat to your house, it can come with challenges because you don't know if the, how healthy the cat is and you bring it into your house. If you have kids, double, <laughs> double risk. So my question now is, what are some of the challenges that can really arise in just as achieving this just transition? And what are some tips you want to give us so we can you know, put that in mind to overcome them? Okay, there's going to be a strong um, um, challenge with behavioral change because for a Ghanaian to change his behavior and accept something new, um, it's going to be tough. However, with testimonials, um, with practical things, when the, with the benefits of why it's important for them to come on board. Um, so let's say you are going to talk to someone who uses, let's say, firewood or charcoal. As you move there, you should have a little piece of evidence of women who have been able to use clean cooking solutions and which have worked for them. Because when they see other women coming on board to use all this clean cooking stuff, they also have it in mind that, oh, okay, A and B used it. They used it this way and it was able to um, help them. Okay, this is the cost. I can be able to afford it. If I'm able to afford it, then that means it's also going to help me to achieve that efficiency award. It's also, it's also going to help me to uh, maybe cook fast, give me good health, help me to reduce the emissions, help me to achieve Ghana's climate ambitions, help me to be um, a, a patriotic citizen, a good citizen. Yeah, help me to be able to put all these things in place such that the environment becomes a good place for us to live. Because there are other countries that are having very bad effects of climate change. In as much as we say that, okay, Ghana contributes a little factor to the, the industrialization and emissions cover. However, if the effect is coming, it doesn't look at the person who contributed small or big. It comes up to everybody and anybody out there. So the biggest challenge will come up with this behavioral change. However, with good testimonials, and then we are looking at how to solve economic status of these people. Because once you're able to address that factor, that is what is going to help them to make their purchasing power. If the purchasing power is low, and if the source of alternative for them to get the money to purchase is low, it's going to be difficult for us to achieve this transition phase. All right, thank you so much for, you know, 
I'm shedding more light on that. And I totally 100% agree with you. So if you are enjoying this session so far, please, 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 please drop an emoji. Um, you can also drop your questions. If you have something that has been on your mind prior to this, um, this session, or if there's already something that has crossed your mind while all this conversation is going on, please don't lose out. Um, Kathy is still here. We can we can grab her now that she's still on the call. Feel free to drop all your questions, and please don't feel reserved or don't hold back on your question because I personally I'm of the opinion that no question is, is stupid or no question is not necessary. Every question is important, and that's why some of the great innovations in the world has happened. You may never know. Maybe your question is the next thing that would you know change. So um. Kafui, I know you mentioned the NDI and NDCs, you know, you mentioned COP, and you also mentioned a couple of other policies, you know, the transition frameworks and everything. What 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 do you think the role of policymakers is in you know facilitating this whole energy transition um revolution? Hello, Kafi, you've muted yourself. They contribute 90% to this transition phase because whatever they agree on is what the world is going to use. So now from last year, we have what has been agreed by the whole world at COP28. So at COP29, there's going to be another alternative. But since this has come up for COP2028, with policymakers, we all have policymakers at um, our schools, at our universities, and all those things. The role they play here is that they have to integrate this into curriculums. I know there's the climate change at the basic level where it can, it's being integrated into curriculum so that students from the class one, class four, are able to learn about the basis of what climate change is, what they need to be aware of that. However, we have to be able to do more with the energy field, like with the energy transition, we should be able to push that, at least students in the um, secondary cycle, because I know every year we have the renewable energy um, challenge, which is done in schools. So this schools, secondary cycle schools come on board then they 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 show they showcase their innovative ideas they come up with smart and innovative ideas about how they can be able to also fit into the renewable energy space so going forward as policy um takers we have a lot of ngos around wanting to policy and all of that the transition phase is not only based for the energy field it's calling for a just energy transition. So if it's calling for a just energy transition, it applies in every space, agriculture, energy, water, and it's every space. It covers every space because it has to do with the people, the economic status, and how we can be able to promote good source of livelihood. Yeah. Right, 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 right. 100%, 100%. Okay, Kavi. I know you already touched on, you know, some of the things that people can really, you know, um, focus on. Okay, let me just mute this person real quick. I think the person doesn't know the person is on. So, okay, the person has been muted. All right, awesome. So, um, I know you already spoke about how to, you know, touch on some of the job areas, but, um, there's of course yes before we should you know uh, implement change there's definitely like um a mitigation approach or method but whether we like it or not there will still be an issue we need to address which is the concern about people actually losing their jobs in traditional energy sectors during this transition so let's take for example a couple of years ago like you mentioned the cartoons we had people who used to, you know, work to, you know, produce this coal that were using the train. When some of these trains transition to, let's say, electric trains or, let's say, for example, gas trains or whatsoever method of um, energy, those people had to face the reality of actually losing their jobs, even though they know, fine, there's a lot of benefits attached to it. We cannot take the fact that there's an emotional perspective, there's, an, there's a financial perspective, and some of these people have families they need to fend for, so... 
how how do you think we can collectively um, address some of these concerns about job loss? I mean, well, I'm trying to look. We're trying to look at it from like the very core traditional perspective. How do you think we can really address the issue of losing jobs? Okay, so some jobs, um, you know, it will, not, it will be inevitable for them to lose their jobs. However, for them, for it to be just, for it to be fair, such that um, no one person is left behind is this. The government, the, um, stakeholders, CSOs, NGOs have to come together and do more capacity building for people so that in every space where you find yourself in, you're already aware about what is going on because believe you me someone is somewhere and has no idea about what renewable energy is what energy efficiency is what our net zero targets is why this even even if we are going to switch into using cars that are ev modeled someone out there has no idea and then he wakes up one day and then in the next 10 to five years we have switched okay news agencies will take this and talk about it media houses might talk about it per the topic or per the minister addressing the issue, but might not also go into it very deeply. So however, what we can do as CSOs, as NGOs, as policy makers, or whatever area that you find yourself in, we should do more capacity building at the grassroots level. So maybe when we are going for our um our switches, our community outreach, we should add this at part of the agendas about what we are going to disseminate to the people. Let them ask us the various questions. Let them give us their grievances. Let us document this. When we have the opportunity to also engage government stakeholders, let us put it out to them to also be able to get solutions out for them. So that if there's a solution that they also need to come on board, we can become the mouthpiece for these people to be able to also be able to come on board. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm learning from my mentor, Kathy. I muted myself and I was saying, right. And I said, okay, I didn't hear anything. <laughs> so um, personally, I wanted to share something, right? Um, thank you so much for, you know, um, this amazing session. This was really, really educative. Like I mentioned, I'm, I'm really learning a lot, even though I'm in the sustainable space. And I believe this is, um, this is how we get started because I believe some people here have actually learned a little bit more about renewable energy and this gives us like has this has also like equipped us to be more knowledgeable so when one speak to people like we speak to people from a very very relatable point of view we speak to people from a very knowledge ground perspective and it doesn't mean that the knowledge has to end here like we can keep learning you know keep sharing ideas you know coming in the same community and see how we can grow together so um uh, I think when you were talking about the issue of, I, I remember vividly you mentioned behavioral change and I'm a very, very big fan of behavioral change. And for me, um, one of the things I really find interesting is the trans theoretical model of change. So basically this, this, this change model was like by two psychologists. I think it was James Prochesca and I think Carlo De Clemente, yeah, I'm not really sure. It was like in the 70s. And they were speaking about like the, the stages of change. Like if you want change to happen, it doesn't just, you don't just wake up and change has happened. It is like process, right? And the reason why I want to highlight this is that I want people to, you know, also look at the sensitive part of, you know, trying to make someone see the value in what you are giving them. For example, there's always like a pre-contemplation -co um, stage. For example, where someone, you tell someone, okay, this thing you are doing has a lot, a lot of pollution. They're like, I've been doing this thing. My mother, my grandmother has been doing this thing. Why would you just come and tell me that? <laughs> Do you get it? This thing has so much pollution, for example. And then you have the, the stage of people like uh, literally thinking, um, hey, this thing, it looks like what this person is saying makes sense. So, and, you know, they start to like weigh the, the pros and cons. For example, Kathy, you're talking about like health factors. For example, if they start to see that uh, someone who has been cooking for eating like um, firewood for like a long time is beginning to have lung issue and you go to the hospital and they tell you that, oh, you're you are inhaling too much um, smoke. You're you are kind of next to like a secondary smoker, even if you've never smoked a stick of cigarettes all your life, you see. So like those are like things where people start to um, um, 
kind of like think about it was it like sense in them and i think in like in the case of fossil fuel that phase will probably be when people can realize that the more sustainable they get the more they can actually save money in terms of efficiency because yeah. like you mentioned coffee if it will take you um eight hours to naturally do something and with a cleaner and more efficiency source it can take you three hours why do you have to wait five extra hours let's be honest so i think that's like a stage of people like to really start to think about it and they kind of like start to prepare and then maybe probably start to do a lot of action and the most important thing or sweet thing about change is the fact that like people who can, who tend to be very resistant of change when they start to benefit or when they start to benefit from like the juicy parts of change they are like the strongest advocate they're like they start to tell people um you know what this thing don't don't use it don't use it it's not nice it's not this and i mean this is like really 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 interesting and for me personally i'm really learning a lot and there's a lot of lots of knowledge in here so for example um just imagine that you have someone who has been selling charcoal and this person has been selling charcoal literally and for most of the traditional areas, most of the jobs people do are like jobs they had learned like from time. If you go to the weaving community, someone has probably been weaving for a long time. Uh, if you go to the, the 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 community where people make canes or baskets, something that they they've been doing like from generation to generation, fishing and all of that. So, for example, if let's say you meet a charcoal seller who has kind of inherited that kind of I'm sorry, someone wants to enter the room. I'm just asking the question real quick. You have that kind of situation where someone has been selling that for a long time. For me, the reason why I'm trying to say use charcoal, for example, is that honestly speaking, if you go to the traditional setting, charcoals and firewoods, you cannot escape from them. Like it's really very common. I see that personally. So I just want to speak from that perspective. And so someone like that, um, and when you start talking about things like you know deforestation things like air pollution things like you mentioned kathy how the climate change or the rainy season is changing right now you can't even predict when it's rainy season, <laughs> when it's rainy season when it's dry season it's it's funny now but it's really not funny for the farmers because if you are a farmer you cannot even predict the water cycle to grow your plants then yeah. it looks like you are you you've gone to farm without tools that's what it is because you don't have the tech you have the technical know-how but it's not enough because there are a lot of things that you cannot predict or look at so i think for someone who sells charcoal or firewood can actually you know start looking at that because obviously they even start cutting trees from their own community they don't even go far the, the trees they cut for their charcoal is from their own community so obviously the heat and everything they start to feel it and i really feel like one of the things stakeholders or individuals can do is really um, explore ways that they can really help to do a lot of workshops and I, the workshop should be like very very simple it could be like in local dialect it could be like in, in you know relatable ways that people can realistically like understand that okay this is what it is this is the pros and cons right and oh someone ruby wants to join the call let me just add her real quick exactly and i think also when it comes to transition the last thing i want to just wrap up with is transition doesn't have to come like one force boom it is a gradual process so if you are trying to speak to someone about transition or you yourself want to transition just be intentional take the little steps and before you know it's going to happen so for example someone is selling charcoal you come to speak to the person about renewable energy expecting that next week the person has thrown all their charcoal away and they're now selling solar cookies <laughs> By the end, that's unexpected, you know, unexpected um timeline. Maybe like if you come the next time, at least it should be reducing, you know, because you also you also have to understand that person has a target audience of people who like what they are doing. So they also need some time to also kind of like educate their people. And now this is where this gets very powerful because when you educate one person, they're able to pass the information across. And this is kind of cause like ripple effect, right? So um, I just wanted to um, look at the comments real quick to see if anyone has any more question for you, Kafui. Uh, I think there's a chat, so let me check it real quick. Oh, someone said, Goswe, I'm here. Yo, we see you, Goswe, Aiko. We see you very, very well. <laughs> Okay, someone said very insightful. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, personally, I said intriguing. Someone sent a smiley face. And I think someone made a comment, Coffee. This is a little bit um, backdated, but this was 
and in response to the first question you posed before you started your presentation and when you asked about what people intend to see from Ghana in like five years this person said I hope to see a leader who think and cares about sanitation and pays so much attention to it okay so yes. I think okay yes. we're going to add some yes i was answering the question and then i was highlighting on the fact that um at a local at a local levels at a district levels presidential levels whenever we are choosing leaders we should make sure that whatever they are presenting to us, the content of their manifestos, the content of whatever they want to push to us, should have an element of, of environmental. Um, when an election year, there's going to be more of them coming to schools, coming to, to see that we, they get our votes. Then we also push mm -hmm. to them what we want. Yes. Right. So we should be able to also hang on the fact that in an election year they are also going to come up to us with blah 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 and then we should mm. be able to push in what we want yeah all right thank you so much coffee um i think that with this we call it a wrap there are no more questions in the chat box i just want to personally say thank you to everyone for making it here with us today today is sunday you could have been sleeping chilling waiting for the next week but you're here we appreciate you and i want to give a shout out to a couple of people from women for sustainability africa and also gloria Kaffee. thank you so much this was a very very insightful insightful session shout out to ruby in fact shout out to anita shout out shout out to every single person here everybody sebastian theresa Goswami. theresa has been here from like the beginning of the thing the the whole thing theresa Charlie, if I had some ugly calculus, I would have given you some. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And hopefully this session is for um this 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 session is called Let's Talk Sustainability for Women for Sustainability Africa. Um please do all to tune in to our next sessions because we have so many exciting topics. Don't forget sustainability, so sustainability is the future. And for you to see the lens, you need to be educated. You need to know what is new and you also need to know how to take charge of it. Thank you so much. My name is Queen Marjana and it's so nice to meet all of you. Bye.